important uh, disjoint support. So then I draw the maximum volume surfaces that are connected to these uh, to these bumpy uh, time-like slices, and I can do the exact same sort of thing as I did uh, as as uh, Matt Hedrick and Tadashi Takinagi did um, in their famous proof. You could take the the later of the two surfaces and then form this. You can't really see it. There's a, like a crease down the middle here. Um, of the surface where you know these two surfaces intersect, and then you could take the earlier of the two surfaces and form this other creased surface. And of course, because these surface are, surfaces are creased, but the extremality equation is some um, differential equation. And solution this cannot be the solution to the extremal surface equation. Uh, there is a solution that is smooth. You know, t equals zero. It's just flat uh, in empty ADS, uh, and uh, you know you get the sort of lumpy like smooth mountainous solution. And so you can immediately infer that the, uh, the, uh, these volumes actually obey inequality in the opposite order, because now these are maximal volumes. So this volume is larger than this, and this volume is larger than this with the same boundary conditions. Yes? Uh, it's not actually important for this. Um, I can explain it if you want. It's, it's literally just if I, if I push forward in time on the boundary, then the, the maximum volume slices push forward in time in a way that they don't intersect. So that one nests inside the other, you get a foliation. Yeah. Uh, this is not actually so important, except that it's, it's interesting that, uh, it, 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 that this proof doesn't rely on that. Um, but uh, it, it is an interesting connection, I think, that uh, is worth further study because it's also relevant for the QNEC. It is true. This was proven in uh, the Couch, Eccles, Jacobson, and Nguyen paper. Right. So okay, so that suggests that we should be considering this uh, this quantity here, the the holographic uh, volume susceptibility, um, which is I, I really just took you know the entropy and I replaced it with uh, or what would have been the minimal area or the extreme malaria, and I replaced it with the, this maximal volume. And again, here, what I'm doing is I'm taking perturbations of uh, the boundary conditions and looking at time-like uh, uh, time variations at disjoint points. And again, you know, for the same reason uh, that uh, strong subadditivity showed that the susceptibility was negative, strong superadditivity shows that this thing is positive. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so what does that actually mean? So we can compute uh, what this is in an example. So let's just do a, a really quick example. So you can uh, just uh, start with uh, the ADS vacuum and you can uh, work perturbatively in uh, the, uh, the boundary stress tensor equivalently and you can, you can just uh, put some gravitons in and work perturbatively in this uh, H alpha beta perturbation. And uh, we'll work in Pfeffer Gram coordinates. Uh, I know it's bad to work in coordinates, but I think it's easiest to say this way. Uh, I should have written alpha beta here, uh, not TT. Sorry about that. Um, but this this metric perturbation is, uh, you know, the leading component is related to the uh, boundary stress tensor. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll describe the maximal volume slices that we're studying as uh, some embedding equation for uh, the time. And uh, just to simplify the calculation, let's assume that t equals zero. Uh, is actually a solution to the maximum volume equation. Uh, so, for example, at a moment of time symmetry. <laughs> okay, so now what do we do? We perturb the boundary conditions at uh, the boundary, uh, specify that, and then expand the uh, volume functional around uh, t equals zero. And so, you, you know, you'll you vary the metric. Um, you, you know, basically, uh, the metric is a function of the uh, time coordinate. So you can expand this time coordinate and powers of the perturbation. Okay, and obviously on the equations of motion, the linear term vanishes. And then the second order term is the guy that we're most interested in. And notice that it is correctly going to localize to the boundary. And that's just, you know, Hamilton Jacobi theory. So this is roughly going to turn into the variation of the conjugate momentum uh, to t uh, uh, on the boundary. Okay, so we don't have time to do algebra, so this is what you get. Um, so I, I've defined some new quantities here. Rho is, is the time time stress tensor, which is picked out again because we're, we're working on a maximal volume slice. Um, define some you know, propagators. G, capital G is a bulk bulk propagator. Lowercase g is a bulk boundary propagator. And uh, you have to regulate the volume somehow. So you, we put in the cutoff. And uh, what you find is that there's this nice um, 
do splitting into diagonal and off-diagonal terms. Not that surprising, uh, but it does have a nice structure. So the diagonal stuff is this stuff in blue, so this first term. Uh, you can see that there's some leading order uh, term which is independent of the energy density. Um, and then some, uh, some uh, small shift due to the presence of energy. Um, and then there's this uh, off-diagonal term here, which uh, involves an integral over the bulk. Uh, in the way that I've computed it, uh, it's a little bit inelegant, but, uh, but uh, you know, so it's a little bit unclear now what to do with this result, except to say that, okay, so I know this thing is positive. So uh, I could just take this positive thing and I can integrate it over one of the variables, say y1. And when I do that, I know that this thing's gonna be positive. And what you get is, you, know, you integrate by parts, one of these becomes a bulk boundary propagator, I integrate over that, um, that gives me a delta function, and it turns out to localize. Um, uh, at least this, this uh, leading order contribution localizes and just gives you a contribution from the energy density. Okay, so I don't know what community you guys are from, but uh, if you're from my community, uh, this result should be really <laughs> worrying. <laughs> okay, so I've been telling people in basically every, almost every talk that I've given uh, that in quantum field theory, there always exist states uh, which violate not only the weak energy condition, which we can live without, but uh, the no energy condition, which is uh, implied by the weak energy condition. Here I'm, I'm saying in these states that I've studied um, that uh, uh, I've, I could show that the weak energy condition is true. Okay, so what's the usual set of examples that you give for negative energy densities? Well, there's uh, reflections off of moving mirrors, uh, Hawking radiation near the, near the uh, horizon of an evaporating black hole. There has to be negative energy density so that uh, we can violate Hawking's area theorem. And uh, the Casimir effect is another famous example of negative energy density. Okay, so uh, at least these first two examples uh, aren't immediately worrying from the example we just did. Uh, those are you know, dynamical situations, non-trivial to check. Uh, um, if, uh, if our calculation is compatible with them because you know, I assumed a moment of time symmetry. Um, the Casimir effect though is initially kind of worrying for me because it seems like a static situation where you, you, we, we seem to have <laughs> uh, derived the wrong result. Okay, you have to of course check a little more carefully here. Now, if you really want to get the Casimir effect, you have to, uh, uh, you know, do some conformal transformation, for example, and then you get an anomalous transformation of the stress tensor, and that anomalous uh, term can violate the weak energy condition, famously. Um, this is relevant, actually, for the definition of the stress tensor that you derive here, um, because uh, that's actually subtracted off in the Pfefferman gram expansion, as far as this calculation is concerned. So unfortunately, uh, this calculation doesn't rule out something that I know is there, or fortunately, actually. Um, but it does bound additional excitations above the energy. So I think this is a new result that uh, I don't think was known before. So, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. No, it's only a statement about holographic theories. Yeah, That's correct. Do you secretly think it's true in all Um, <laughs> I haven't given that question enough thought. That was true for the QNEC. That was true for the QNEC. Sure, I'll conjecture that today. <laughs> it costs nothing to conjecture. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, so, so the exception for Casimir energy, right. So I had to, so here I need to sort of take the cutoff to zero. So I need to sort of be working in this, in, in here, you know, actually this calculation was done in like a flat space, uh, flat boundary. So there'd be additional terms here for like curved uh, boundaries. And you can try to get around that, you know, you can try to work on a conformally flat background by just taking a conformal transformation, but then the anomalous piece is subtracted off in this inequality. So you don't derive a contradiction with the Casimir effect. So, Right. Uh, so certainly in any case where I guess I start with a, 
a flat plane and then try to do conformal transformations off of the, you know, off of a flat plane then I, or off of a flat space, then I would expect that uh, uh, so something like this should be true generally. More generally, yeah, you'd have to actually go through the calculation of whatever the maximal volume slices, you know, whatever the actual uh, maximal volume susceptibility MVS is. Okay, so uh, that was the quantitative portion of the evening. Uh, <laughs> I'll just give a brief summary since they don't have a lot of time. Um, this is some interesting quantity, which I think is worth uh, studying further. Uh, we saw that strong superadditivity implied the positivity of this quantity, uh, and it leads to an interesting geometrical proof of uh, the weak energy condition in these sort of symmetric perturbative cases. Um, so uh, when we initiated this project, we were hoping for a relationship with, uh, with uh, the energy uh, uh, positivity relations of these guys, Lashkari, Leonaguri, Stoika, and Ramstonk. Um, I think uh, it's very promising, but uh, we haven't completed that calculation. Uh, another obvious thing to do is to study these uh, diagonal terms that show up in the calculation, like the QNEC. Uh, like I said, uh, nesting near the boundary was important for the proof of the QNEC, and this obeys similar properties, so I expect there's something interesting to be said. Uh, we also know now that uh, maximum volume slices are related to boundary symplectic forms. It would be interesting to study that relationship, and maybe to derive some uh, bounds on energy density in uh, weak gravity scenario scenarios in randall sundrum sort of setups, where there's uh, some weak gravity induced on some brain. That's uh, somewhere in the bulk. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Questions? Comments? Uh, okay. Thank you. Yes. Hey, uh, I guess, is, is there some volume version of this other, this MMI thing that people do for uh, entanglement holographically? Of MMI? Uh, I'm not sure about that, maybe. Uh, <laughs> I'd have to think about that. Yeah. Right. You can actually even just study what MMI um, gives you in sort of an infinitesimal sense. I'm not sure how well this has been studied also, just studying, you know, normal MMI, but infinitesimal versions of it. Um, I, I'm not, I, I, I don't know enough to say right now. Okay, if there's no more questions, let's thank okay. our speaker again. Are there any announcements? Okay, then. Uh, is there? Uh, yeah, I think it would be lost. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. Should we take a break? Or? Yeah. Twenty, maybe. Just twenty. Okay, so we're gonna start at five twenty. <laughs> Short break. <laughs> So we're going to start at 5.20. Short break. <laughs>
Okay. <laughs> Shall we start? Shall we start? Uh, okay. Uh, actually, I don't take this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so in that case, we, we just go directory. So, so, so in theory, it's for you to put it directly. It's just. Okay, so in the last talk of today, Tomo Yukimori Mai will tell us about fine grain quantum supremacy. Please. Okay, thank you for the introduction. So, uh, I'm, my name is Tomo Yukimori Mai from here, and today I'm, I'm going to talk about fine grain quantum supremacy. And this is a joint work with Suguru Tamaki uh, of Hyogo University. And for details, please see these papers. So this talk is about quantum computing. Uh, so people believe uh, quantum computing is uh, faster than classical computing. But uh, in terms of complexity theory, this is a still open problem. So this morning, uh, Thomas explained these complexity classes. And P is a class of uh, problems, problems which can be efficiently solved with classical uh, deterministic computer. And this is a probabilistic version. And this is a quantum version. And this P space is a class of problems which can be solved with efficient memory. Okay? And in terms of this complexity theory, uh, quantum computing is faster than classical computing means BQP is not equal to BPP. But this is not yet shown. And actually, people believe that showing this is very difficult because if you can show this, show this, then you can show P is not equal to P space, which is one of the uh, uh, long standing open question in uh, classical complexity theory. That said, uh, there are so many uh, evidence that suggest that quantum computing is uh, really faster than classical computing. And these results are categorized into the following three uh, types. So one approach is just you construct some concrete quantum algorithm, and you show that this algorithm is faster than known best classical algorithm, OK? Such as factoring or simulation and so on. And this is one advantage of this approach is useful. So somehow useful because uh, these algorithms can solve some uh, uh, useful problem in realistic world. Okay. But one advantage is uh, you are not sure whether these problems are really hard for classical. So maybe you know that recently uh, there are some uh, quantum inspired classical algorithm for for some problems. So this means maybe a uh, best known classical algorithm uh, might be updated in your future. Okay. And second approach is query complexity. So this means you uh, consider some uh, part of your computing as subroutine and just you count the number of queries to the subroutine. And you show that the number of query is uh, fewer than classical correspondence. So, for example, Simon's algorithm and Grover's algorithm are famous examples. And again, they are somehow useful because uh, these algorithms are, are used in many applications of quantum algorithms. Okay? And another advantage is you can uh, rigorously show the difference between quantum and classical. So, this means you can show that quantum is really faster than classical. But one disadvantage is uh, because you consider uh, oracles, subroutines, so this is not the uh, real time complexity. Okay? And the third approach, uh, which is the main subject of this talk, is sampling or uh, quantum supremacy. And in this approach, uh, we consider some uh, weak machines, like boson sampling, IQP, DQC, which I, which I will explain later. And uh, we show that these machines cannot be classically simulated. Okay? And one advantage is uh, we can show quantum advantage of these models uh, based on some uh, strong conjecture in classical complexity theory. Okay? And another advantage is uh, we don't need any universal machine, just some uh, sub-universal weak machines are enough to show this type of quantum advantage. The one disadvantage is we don't know any uh, useful application because just we sample output of quantum computing, so we don't know whether 
how, how we can use this uh, uh, sampling to, rea uh, to realistic application. Okay, and sampling is uh, more precisely the following procedure. So you have some quantum computer uh, that output n bit uh, string z with probability pz. Okay, and I say that this quantum machine is classically simulated, sampled in time t. If there exists some classical probabilistic t time algorithm that output n bit string z with probability qz. And these probabilities are close with each other in this sense. Okay? In this sense, I say that this quantum machine is classically simulated. And what we show uh, in quantum supremacy is if uh, uh, these quantum computing can be classically simulated in polynomial time, then the polynomial hierarchy collapses to the second level. And this polynomial hierarchy is some generalization of uh, NP. So NP is explained in today's uh, Thomas uh, lecture. And this uh, polynomial hierarchy is some kind of generalization of NP. And people believe that uh, collapse of pH will not happen. So if you assume that this type of thing will not happen, then uh, this result suggests that these quantum computing cannot be classically simulated. Okay. And another advantage of quantum supremacy is uh, you don't need to construct some uh, perfect universal machine to demonstrate your quantum advantage. So one ultimate goal in quantum computing is to construct some ultimate machine. So this means you can use infinitely many uh, quantum qubits, and also you can do any quantum algorithm. And also this is a perfectly fault tolerant. But of course this is very difficult. And even a uh, factoring of uh, 1024 bits, uh, which is believed to be difficult, with uh, current supercomputer is also very difficult if you do with uh, Schwarz factoring algorithm. So for example, uh, you need 2,000 qubits and also you need 10 to 11 quantum gates. Okay? And this is, of course, very difficult with current technology. And so currently what people are trying to show is some type of near-term goal. So I mean, uh, they construct some type of weak machine incomplete weak machine, but still they show that this machine exhibit some type of advantage over uh, classical computing. Okay? And in quantum supremacy, I mean, if you consider sampling, this type of demonstration can be easily demonstrated. So this is one advantage of considering sampling. Okay? And one example of uh, so, uh, such a weak model is a so-called one clean qubit model or a DQC1 model. So, in standard quantum computation, you can prepare many pure qubits. Okay? But uh, for one clean qubit model, uh, you can prepare only, only single pure qubit, and all other uh, input states are just maximally mixed state. Mixed state. And this model was originally introduced by Zen to explain NMR quantum computing. And uh, it looks very weak. And actually, it was shown that this model is, is not universal, as long as you consider natural encoding of information on quantum state. Okay? And maybe even you might think that this model is classically simulatable. And of course, if you remove this single pure qubit, then this model is trivially classically simulated. But interestingly, if you have this single pure qubit, then this model uh, 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 might have some uh, uh, power over classical computing. So one example is uh, uh, the one shown by Shaw uh, and Jordan. So they show that calculated Jaws polynomial can be done uh, with this model faster than classical algorithm. So this is one example which suggests that this model is stronger than classical computing. Okay. But the problem here is, again, so this classical best algorithm might be uh, updated in the future. So someone might find some uh, new classical algorithm for Jones polynomial. And if one such algorithm is found, then the quantum advantage of one clean qubit model no longer exists. Okay. But we show but we show uh, so you mean some uh, calculation of Jones polynomial is BQP hard and so yeah uh, I actually so uh, uh, actually there are many types of uh, approximation of Jones polynomial and some of them are BQP complete and some of them can be done one green qubit model so actually it is known whether BQP is equal to DQC1 class so uh, so anyway okay. 
So, uh, so we show that uh, one green qubit model cannot be classically simulated uh, unless polynomial hierarchy is collapsed to the second level. And this collapse is not believed to happen. So uh, this result suggests that you cannot classically simulate this one green qubit model. Okay. And another example uh, which uh, we, we studied is a so-called HC1Q model. So here uh, you apply many other amalgate and then you apply some classical circuit. Okay. And again you apply some other amalgate. And this type of circuit is uh, in the second level of the Fourier hierarchy, uh, which contains many useful algorithms, like Shor's algorithm and Simon's algorithm and so on. And again, uh, we show that this model cannot be classically simulated unless the, the polynomial hierarchy collapses to the second level. Okay. So in this way, uh, you can show that many weak models cannot be classically simulated. So in addition to these our models, uh, so for example, depth four circuit uh, was the oldest example that you cannot classically simulate. And also boson sampling is a famous example. So also experimental demonstration was done. So this is some kind of non-interacting non-interacting photonic qubit system, but still they show that still this cannot be classically simulated. And also quantum circuit consisting of commuting gates, and also some uh, type of some kind of Hamiltonian time evol evolving system. And also recently uh, they show that uh, random circuit. So this means uh, each gate is randomly chosen, but still this, this type of random quantum computation cannot be classically simulated. Okay. okay, so far I have explained uh, basics of uh, 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 quantum supremacy. So this is some kind of some uh, traditional result of quantum supremacy. So now let's move on to the main subject of uh, my talk, uh, which is fine grade quantum supremacy. And motivation is as follows. So as I, I have explained, uh, all previous quantum supremacy results say uh, some weak quantum machine cannot be classically simulated in polynomial time unless polynomial hierarchy collapses. But these results do not uh, exclude the possibility of super polynomial type classical simulation. So this means maybe you can simulate these weak models in some exponential time or in some super polynomial time. And actually there are some uh, non-trivial exponential time classical algorithm to simulate quantum computing. So one famous result is uh, uh, the one by Brabi, Smith, Morin, Cosset. So they show that this time is enough to classically simulate quantum computing over Clifford gates and T, T gates. Okay. So one uh, interesting question is, can we also exclude some exponential time classical simulation? And actually the answer is yes. So we can show that uh, these weak models cannot be classically simulated even in exponential time, in some exponential time. And of course, under some uh, conjectures. Okay. But to show this result, uh, standard complexity theory will not be useful because they consider only difference between polynomial or exponential. But fortunately, uh, there is a uh, so-called fine-grade complexity theory in classical complexity theory. So they care about some factor of the power of complexity. So for example, they assume some conjectures, which I explain later. And assuming this conjecture, they show some lower bound of classical algorithms. Okay. So uh, exponential time hypothesis is, is uh, one, most, one of the most well studied examples. So now I explain this ETH. So uh, I warn you that Kyoto is a very dangerous city. So one example is the following. So the dean of a university in Kyoto, who is from Africa, uh, held a home party every night. Okay. Then a neighbor said, so you, you look very happy. It's very exciting. Then uh, next time he invited her to his party. Then what happened? Do, do, do you know what happened? Actually, so <laughs> the neighbor called the police. So this means, <laughs> uh, so it is often say, people say that what Kyoto people say are different from what they Think. So maybe, uh, so every time you have to, <laughs> okay, so, so every time you have to uh, do some uh, correct choice, okay, so invite her or apologize to her. And if you make some wrong choice, uh, you will die in Kyoto. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, so your, your goal is to find some solution among exponentially many possibilities. Okay. And P versus NP conjecture says you cannot solve this problem in polynomial time. Okay. And this ETH is a more pessimistic version of this conjecture. So this says you need this exponential time 
to find this surviving gas. Okay. And this strong ETH is a stronger version of ETH, which says uh, almost this time is necessary. So this means almost a brute force computation is necessary to solve this problem. Okay. Okay, so uh, more precisely, this is the following conjecture. So for any A, there exists K, integer K, such that KCN sat over N variables cannot be solved in this exponential time. So this A can be any uh, number, so this means this is almost close to 2 to N. Okay. And, but we slightly modify this conjecture for our purpose. So our conjecture is the following. So let F be a log depth Boolean circuit over N variables. Then for any A, deciding this or this cannot be done in non-deterministic this exponential time. So this gap is a difference between the number of solutions minus number of non-solutions. And your task is you have to decide whether this is equal, this is not equal to zero or this is equal to zero. Okay. And also uh, here, uh, instead of uh, this gap probe, uh, sorry, instead of deterministic time, you need non-deterministic time. So this non-deterministic time is a notion that was uh, explained in this morning lecture. So you are given some kind of hint, witness, and then you can do some computation. So this, of course, this non-deterministic time is stronger than usual deterministic time because you are given some witness. Okay. So in summary, uh, there are three points that are different from the original set. So first difference is they consider KCNF, but here we consider log depth Boolean circuit. So this KCNF is a, a special example of log, de log depth Boolean circuit. So this means our conjecture is more reliable than this one. And secondly, uh, they consider SAT problem. So this means they are interested in whether the number of solutions is non-zero or equal to zero. But here we consider this gap problem. Okay? And actually, we don't know uh, whether this makes our conjecture less stable. But at least at this moment, we don't know any other efficient algorithm to solve this problem, except for directly computing the number of solutions. So this means maybe this modification maybe uh, increase the reliability of our conjecture. But thirdly, because now we consider non-deterministic time, but so because non-deterministic time is very strong than, stronger than deterministic time, so this means maybe our conjecture is less stable than the original sense. Since you hear about the mother, you mean that you are given, I'm sorry, you mean that you're given a witness and with the witness it still will take you two to the one minus a times n. Time, yeah? Or maybe just you can consider some non-deterministic computation whose time is equal to this, this exponential time. Okay, so anyway, uh, so at, at, at least at this moment, we don't know any counter example to this conjecture. So just let's assume the correctness of this conjecture. Okay, then uh, I can show that uh, one clean qubit model, n qubit one clean qubit model, cannot be classically simulated in this exponential time. Okay. So this means, uh, in previous quantum supremacy result, we show that one clean qubit model cannot be classically simulated in polynomial time. But now our result says one clean qubit model cannot be classically simulated in exponential time, even in exponential time. Okay. And for simplicity here, I consider only one clean qubit model, but similar technique can be used for other sub-universal models, such as HC1Q model and so on. Okay. Okay, so just I quickly explain the idea of my proof. So uh, it is known that any log depth Boolean circuit F can be computed with this circuit. So you have n input qubits and one single working qubit. And by doing a control operation, you can compute this F. Okay? And by using this circuit, I can construct a quantum circuit V that satisfies this relation. Okay? So this is very easy. Just first you apply Adamar, and then you, you apply this circuit, and again you apply Adamar. And then finally you apply Z here. Then this quantity is equal to this. Okay. And from this uh, V, I construct uh, the following uh, DQC1 model. Okay. Then uh, by direct computation, you can show that acceptance probability of this one green qubit model 
satisfies this relation. So if gap of f is not equal to zero, then your acceptance probability is uh, positive. And if this is equal to zero, then your acceptance probability is equal to zero. Okay. So now assume that this uh, quantum acceptance probability can be classically simulated in this time, in this exponential time. So this means there exists some classical this time machine that accepts with this probability such that this is satisfied. So this is just a definition of my classical simulation. Okay, but then if a gap of f is not equal to zero, then classical acceptance probability is non uh, is positive. But if this is equal to zero, then classical acceptance probability is equal to zero. Okay. So this means I have a non-deterministic this time algorithm that can solve this decision problem. But this contradicts to the conjecture, which I explained. Therefore, uh, you cannot classically simulate this machine. Okay. Okay. And so, so far I have explained a strong exponential time hypothesis, but actually there are many other uh, fine-grade conjectures. And one uh, well-studied conjecture is so-called orthogonal vector. So here uh, you are given some set of uh, vectors. And your task is you have to decide whether there exist some uh, pair of vectors that are orthogonal with each other. Okay. And again, I slightly modify the original orthogonal vector conjecture. So instead of deterministic time, now I consider non-deterministic time. And also instead of the SAT type problem, I consider this gap type problem. So this is a number of orthogonal vectors, and this is a number of non-orthogonal vectors. And your task is you have to decide whether this gap is non not equal to zero or equal to zero. Okay. Again, assuming this conjecture, I can show that several quantum computing models, including DQC1, HC1Q, cannot be classically simulated in this exponential time. Okay. And one important point is this orthogonal vector is derived from SES. So this means even if SES is refuted, orthogonal vector could survive, could still survive. Okay. So just the proof is the same as the previous one. So just I construct some quantum circuit that satisfies this relation. And then again, I assume that this, uh, this quantum probability is classically simulated. Then this means I can solve the uh, orthogonal vector problem in this time, which is contradiction. Okay. okay. And so another conjecture often studied is so called three sum. So you are given a set of integers, and you have to decide whether there exist a triple of integers whose sum is equal to zero or not. And again, I, we consider this, this gap version. So difference between the number of good triple minus number of bad triple. And also non-deterministic time. Okay. Then I can show that quantum computing models, weak quantum computing models, cannot be classically simulated in this exponential time. Okay. And the important point is uh, no relation is known between sets and three sum. So this means even if SES is refuted, still three sum could survive. Okay. So proof is the same. So just I, I will skip. Okay. So so far I have explained uh, n scaling. So n is a number of qubit. So this means uh, I'm interested in the complexity, time complexity of classical simulation of uh, quantum computing in terms of number of qubit n. Okay. So far I have explained. But another interesting scaling is a T scaling. So Clifford gate and the T gates are known to be universal. So T is this gate. Okay? And the people often say that Clifford is easy, but T is difficult. So this means fault tolerant implementation of Clifford gate is easy, but that for T gate is difficult. So people believe that near term machine will be dominated by Clifford gates. So you have many Clifford gates, and few of them will be T gates. And in this case, if you want to classically simulate this machine, then you are interested in the T scaling. So you are interested in how the time complexity grows uh, in terms of T, T gate. Okay? And if you consider this type, type of T scaling complexity, there are some results. And one trivial upper bound is this time. So of course, by doing brute force computation, you can compute. You can simulate your quantum computing in this exponential time. 
。And another trivial lower bound is this polynomial type. So assuming BQP is not equal to BPP, of course you cannot simulate in this polynomial type. And one uh, non trivial upper bound is this one by Brabi Smith's small concept. So they show that uh, Clifford plus T, T gate quantum computing can be classically simulated in this exponential time. Okay? And their idea is as follows. So uh, U is uh, any quantum circuit over Clifford gate and T number of T gates. Then you can construct uh, Clifford circuit that simulate this U. So this means this Clifford circuit act on all zero state and T copy of T magic state. So this T magic state is this state. Okay. And if you measure here, then uh, you can realize this state. So this means by consuming T magic states, you can simulate this T circuit. Okay. And this is constructed by using this magic state gadget. So by consuming a single copy of T magic state, you can implement this T gate. Okay. Then uh, the algorithm is uh, as follows. I, I mean, the algorithm is, is more, uh, I mean, more complicated, and they, they can uh, do simulation in, in many tasks. But just for simplicity, I, I explain the, uh, the simplest case. So this is your quantum circuit U uh, that uh, consists of Clifford gate and T number of T gates. But as I, I have explained, uh, you can write this quantity in this way. So this is some Clifford circuit acting on all zero state and T copy of T magic state. Okay. But now let's assume that this T copy of T state is written as a linear combination of stabilizer states. So stabilizer state is a state generated by acting uh, some Clifford gate on all zero state. Okay. Then if I put this here, uh, I have this, this quantity. But this part can be classically efficiently computed by using Gottes manual theorem because this is a stabilizer state and this is a Clifford circuit. So your task is just you compute this quantity many times and just you add all terms uh, which need this chi time. So time complexity of classically simulate computing this value is just chi. Okay? And what they have shown is this chi is abandoned by this quantity. So therefore, uh, in this time, you can compute this value. So this means you can classically simulate your quantum computer. Uh, so I, idea is um, uh, maybe uh, you will see later when I uh, define stabilizer rank. Okay, so one unnatural question is uh, can we improve their this time complexity? And actually their result is not known to be optimal. Okay, so maybe you can improve their algorithm to, to this time, for example. But one result is uh, you cannot improve their complexity to this time. Okay, to this time. So I mean, if ETH is true, then uh, Clifford plus TT gate quantum computing cannot be classically simulated in this time. Okay, but I have uh, two notions. So firstly, ETH is this conjecture. So you cannot solve three CNF SAT problem in this complexity time. Okay, and here for simplicity, I consider strong simulation. So strong simulation means you compute the output probability distribution. This is very strong, stronger than uh, sampling, which I study here. And of course, we can show similar result for sampling, but just for simplicity, let's consider strong simulation. And also, this result was independently shown by these people. Okay? And the proof idea is as follows. So you have some uh, 3CNF or, or with n variables. And by using some lemma, uh, you can derive this another version of ETH. So now here, a number of variable n is replaced with number of clauses m. Okay? You can change this in this way. So now this f is a 3CNF with m clauses. So this means you have two m and gates and m minus one or gates. Okay? And if you simulate this reversibly, each and and or gate can be simulated by using Toffoli gate. So this means you need this number of Toffoli gates. And each toggle gate can be uh, simulated by using seven T gates. So uh, finally, you have this number of T gates. So in summary, uh, you can construct a unitary circuit such that uh, this is equal to this one, number of solutions. And also this U consists of Clifford gates and this T number of T gates. Okay. And now assume that you can compute this quantity in this time. But this t is equal to the, so order of t is equal to the order of m. So this means you can compute this quantity in this time. 
But this means you can compute this quantity in this time, which contradict to ETH. And now assume that you can compute this quantity in this time. Okay, so now I explain stabilizer rank conjecture. So, uh, so stabilizer rank is some type of measure to quantify magicness or non stabilizerness of your state. So, stabilizer rank is defined in the following way. So, given state of psi, you, you write your state in as a linear combination of stabilizer state with complex uh, coefficients. Okay, and stabilizer rank is a minimum integer k such that this is satisfied. Okay. And they show that this stabilizer rank is upper bounded by this quantity. Okay. And so this is why, why their time complexity is coming from this. And maybe later I, I can explain why this is derived. But anyway, just uh, uh, let me continue. And one known best lower bound is this one. This is not strong. This is only square root of t. Okay. And they conjecture that this stabilizer rank of t copy of t magic state is lower bounded by this exponential quantity. So this is so-called stabilizer rank conjecture. But actually, if you assume a ETH, you can show this stabilizer rank conjecture. Okay. And the idea is the same, as I explained. If you can, so if stabilizer rank is smaller than this quantity, then you can compute uh, this quantity very fast, which means you can violate ETH. But one technical problem is here I assume that this C, C, this C and this phi are efficiently computable given J. And the reason why I need this is when you compute this quantity, this quantity must be efficiently computable. And also this state must be efficiently constructed. Otherwise, I cannot compute this quantity in polynomial time. Okay. But here, in the definition of stabilizer rank, they don't assume anything about the complexity of them. So maybe there exists some nice decomposition, but they might be very difficult to compute. Okay. But still, if you assume non-uniform ETH, uh, you can show the uh, stabilizer rank conjecture. So idea is now uh, this C and this phi is given as advice. Okay. So this means so you are given this value and this value as advice. So maybe they, their complexity is very high, but still they are given as advice. Then you can compute this quantity by using Gottes manual, and then you can compute this quantity in this chi time. Okay. The one technical difficulty is uh, we have to show that this C can be advice. So this, so this means the uh, size to describe this is upper bounded by some exponential value. Otherwise, this cannot be uh, uh, advice. But by doing some computation, we show that actually this can be advice. OK, so and also uh, another interesting scaling is H scaling. So it is known that Adamal plus classical gates are universal. But classical, is, classical gates are, of course, classical. So this means H is some type of resource of quantum speed up. And then, uh, so we are also interested in uh, uh, classical complexity of classical simulation in terms of H counting. And we show that uh, if uh, the Cessler conjecture is true, then we need this time to simulate Adamal uh, plus Toffoli quantum computing. Okay. okay, so this is a summary of my talk. So uh, P is not equal to NP is one conjecture in classical complexity theory. And if you generalize, so in this morning, uh, Thomas explained uh, IP stuff. And IP is one uh, generalization of NP. But another generalization is polynomial hierarchy, or this ETH, and so on. And so this PH will not collapse is one generalization. P is not equal to NP. And if you assume this, then you can show that these models cannot be classically simulated. And these are some traditional result of quantum supremacy. But uh, here, uh, I show that by considering another generalization of P is not equal to NP, we can show that some quantum computing models cannot be classically simulated, even in exponential time, in terms of number of qubits or number of T gates. And by the way, uh, uh, these people also show uh, similar results. So they show that, so for example, they show that the boson sampling IQP and QAOA cannot be classically simulated in some exponential time by assuming some conjecture. And also, they show uh, some impossibility of strong simulation, and so on. And also, there are some uh, conjectures which are independent from this. And again, by using this conjecture, uh, I can show that quantum computing cannot be classically simulated in some uh, exponential time. 
Okay, so, so that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. We have plenty of time for questions, comments. So, so you define this quantity chi or in terms of the composition of your T state. In terms. Can we understand this T, uh, this chi in terms of some physical way, like entanglement or complexity? Uh, so some, some, some quantity which we can, I mean, count some number, I mean, so, so rather than chi. Yeah, yeah, so much motivation of introducing this type of uh, uh, quantity is we want to measure how uh, how uh, you can gain. I, I mean, this is some example of resource theory. So in our resource theory, uh, so for Clifford gate is a free resource, but if you have some this uh, resource resource state or T state, then you can uh, gain the uh, uh, quantum speed up. And just we want to quantify how much resource we need to achieve quantum speed up and so on. Actually, in addition to the stabilizer rank, we have many other measures like robustness of magic and mana and so on. So maybe, I don't know how this is related to entanglement, but this is another example of resource theory. So entanglement so is one example of resource theory, and also you have some thermodynamics is another example of resource theory, but this is another example of resource theory. Can, is it interesting to see this quantity in quantum many body system? I don't know how this is related to it. Does this play some interesting role in spin system? Uh, I don't know any example. Because it's if you know. This is mm, I don't know any paper uh, where you compute this type of thing in, in condensed matter example. If you know, I don't know. Thanks. Maybe just a, as a generalization of your question, one can ask, one can define instead of the stabilizer rank, the polynomial rank or something like that, which would be a sum of states which are, all of them are easy to generate in polynomial time by quantum circuits. So in some sense, these would be states of low entanglement or of some low complexity of entanglement. And then you ask how many states you need how many such states you need to express that state. So that could be, I don't know, that could be really relate to your question. I don't know the answer, I don't know anything yeah, but about that. But. Yeah, but this is a very important point. So actually recently Josa and uh, his collaborators uploaded the paper which says uh, much gate is classically simulated, but if you have some uh, four qubit GHZ state as a resource, so then you can perform universal quantum computation. So in this case, free resource is a much gate circuit and resource state is a four qubit GHZ state. So as, as, as Dorit uh, suggested, uh, we, we have some many generalizations. And also, I can just quickly explain uh, how, how this stabilizer rank is derived. So the idea is as follows. So first, they show that this chi of 6 is upper bound by 7. So just by doing try and error, they show this relation. Okay. Then, you can show that T so just by doing try and error, they show this. Then you can show And this is actually equal to oh, yeah, yeah, seven, seven, sorry, sorry. Okay. So idea is so the so their decomposition is not optimal. So just they by doing some numerics and try and error, they show that for six copy of T state, this is above and by seven. I mean so this is not optimal. Maybe maybe you can consider more some nice clever decomposition. But at least this is satisfied. So if you consider six block of six copy of T magic state, then you can you have some nice upper bound. Uh, by the way, this six and seven are not precise. I forgot the precise number, but the idea is something like that. Maybe this is a four or five or I, I don't remember what. Anyway, idea is this kind of thing. Okay.
By the way, this is six on the okay. There's no more questions. Let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> Just no announcements. Then <laughs> see you tomorrow. There's no more questions. Let's thank the speaker again. Just no announcements. Then <laughs> see you tomorrow. Thank <laughs> you.